bulletin is obviously wrong. We are going to have a message today being thankful. And obviously, the week before Thanksgiving, you would kind of expect that. And it reminds me of a little boy who was asked to say grace at Thanksgiving dinner, a little four-year-old boy. And he dutifully bowed his head, and he thanked God for all of his friends, named them one by one, named every one of his family, and said how thankful he was for them. He thanked God for the turkey. He thanked God for the mashed potatoes and gravy. He thanked God for the pie. And then he stopped. And he hesitated, and he looked at his mom and says, Mom, if I thank God for the broccoli, won't he know I'm lying? You know, sometimes I'm a little bit like that boy. I do not always come to Thanksgiving with an attitude of thankfulness. In fact, there have been a few Thanksgivings where I come and I'm going, I don't know, God. This isn't exactly the year I feel very thankful. I am, in fact, not real happy with the way things are going right now. And I think too often we can get into an attitude of not being thankful and being overwhelmed by the problems of the world and not realize just what God has done for us. And I think part of that problem is, is because of the way we deal with life. We are a small picture kind of people. I know what's happening in my life right now. And I know what happened last night. And I know what happened tomorrow. And I, I know these things and I focus on the things that are going on. When I wake up in pain, I remember that I'm in pain. I don't remember that I should be thankful that I woke up. And the truth of it is, it's easy to get the small picture thinking and not be thankful for the things God has done for us. And a guy named Paul, you may have heard of him, he wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, and he wrote a book called Philippians. And when he wrote the book of Philippians, he was in prison. And he knew he was about to die. And while he's in prison, preparing to die, there are people trash-talking him and his ministry. There are people being jealously trying to outdo him and say he wasn't as good as he was. And instead of getting mad, instead of getting frustrated, instead of seeing the small picture, Paul looked at the bigger picture. And I think... Maybe with what Paul did, he can teach us a thing or two on how to be thankful sometimes when we don't feel. Our first scripture today is in Philippians 1, verses 12 through 21. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me is really serving to advance the gospel. So it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest of the imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers have become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me with my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and that is, I rejoice. Yes, I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out to my, for my deliverance. It is in my eager expectation and hope I will not only be, not at all be ashamed, but when all full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or death, for to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. What Paul is saying very simply is he refuses to be mad, and he rejoices in all the problems. Now, I will tell you that rejoicing in your problems is something that's easy to do when you're not in the midst of your problems. You know, it's real easy to say, well, God takes care of me when nothing's wrong is going on in your life. But let a few things go wrong, and you suddenly find yourself going, well, is God really taking care of me? Am I really? You know, it don't take much. Just let your car not start. 
get a cold, get any other kind of problem that can face you. And you know what? Suddenly you quit being thankful and you start being regretful. You start asking yourself, is God really taking care of me? And that's the problem because what I'm doing when I do those things, when I start to question God, is I'm looking at the small picture. And what Paul is telling me to do is to look at the big picture. Because Paul's life is not a pretty one. Like I said, he's in prison. He's waiting to die. He's going to die very shortly after writing this book. The churches he's founded are having troubles. The infighting within the church that continues to this day was already starting. And that had to be frustrating for a man who was the founder of those churches. There were people trying to take credit for what he had done. And if I were in Paul's shoes, or in his case, probably sandals, I think I would be caught up with an attitude of not being very thankful. I might be sitting there going, you know, God, this isn't fair. Look at what I've done, and look how people are treating me. And I think what Paul does, instead of doing what I would feel like doing, is he takes it on a bigger picture. And he's next, he makes his thankfulness not based on how he feels, but what he knows. I'm here to tell you, Paul's life was anything but comfortable at this moment. He was in definite pain and suffering, being in prison, waiting to die. And I will tell you that if you allow yourself to focus on the small things of life, the problems you will be overwhelmed. It will steal your thankfulness. Paul, unfortunately, or fortunately, did not allow that to happen. He kept a bigger picture. When he said to be to Christ, living for Christ was all he would do, and to, get, to die for Christ was to gain even more, Paul was making a very simple fact true. I live in a big picture world. What's happening to me is irrelevant compared to what the world is doing with Jesus Christ. And he continues this attitude in Philippians 3, verses 8 through 11. And if you read these verses, you have to ask yourself, can I live up to these words? Because I find myself saying I, I lack, unfortunately. Paul says, indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that comes from the faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in death, that by all means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. What Paul is simply saying here is that nothing is important to him except Jesus Christ. Every struggle he's faced, every loss he has ever had is nothing to him. Now, I will tell you that to make a statement like that when you're not suffering loss is pretty easy to do. I don't know. I, I call it Sunday school answers. There's always those folks that will say, you know, what are you supposed to do when you have hard times? Well, you trust God. That's called a Sunday school answer. It's true. That's what you're supposed to do. But I'm here to tell you, you're not as confident making that statement when you're in neck deep in the mud and things are going absolutely wrong. The Sunday school answers seem to escape you when things are going really bad. And I'm here to tell you, I am not immune. I have felt that even in the last few weeks. And so it is amazing to me how much I need to be reminded of this. And I suspect so do you. Paul refuses to look at the present problems and refuses to look at his present suffering and base his thankfulness on that. Instead, he keeps his eye on Jesus Christ and the kingdom to come. 
What Paul is saying is, if my suffering brings about one person to Christ, I'm happy to suffer more. And I'll be honest with you, when I look at Paul and his attitude, I'm kind of humbled. Because I can see just how easily Satan steals my thankfulness away. Just give me a few minor problems, and I find myself lamenting, why me? I just shared with you a few weeks ago that I ran into a semi with my van. Not a pleasant experience, and it's been coming more and more expensive as every day goes by. I think the total is going to be real short to about $20,000 by the time I'm done. And it hurts. I'm not going to deny, it hurts. And coming right before Thanksgiving, it could easily say, well now Rick, what do you got to be thankful for this week? And I have to say, well, I'm standing and hitting semis with a van. Not everybody comes out like that because too many people don't even survive it, let alone come out walking. So I guess if you look at it even from the small picture, I've got a lot to be thankful for. And in the old judgment of things, when I look at it from God's perspective, when I look at it from heaven's perspective, that accident is nothing more than a minor bump and an opportunity to share with others about the love of God and the protection of God. My friends, I'm here to tell you, if you focus on nothing but the small picture of the troubles that you're going through and the struggles that you're facing, you will have a difficult time being thankful because I will tell you, Satan will remind you of every problem you have. And I'm here to tell you, I don't know anybody out there that doesn't have at least one or two problems. And some of you got way more than one or two. And if you focus on them, you will, in fact, have a hard time being thankful. Paul goes on in Philippians 4, verses 4 through 9. And he uses words, again, that I really have trouble with sometimes. He says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and God of peace will be with you. I know very few people who have suffered as much as Paul. And when he writes, rejoice always and be anxious about nothing. I'm here to tell you, this is a man who can speak with authority on that subject. Now, if you're like me, I find myself not rejoicing and being extremely anxious about a lot of things. You know, it's amazing to me how I can be fine and dandy until I lay my head on a pillow and I step down and I go, oh, did I remember to do, to, oh, and, and suddenly I have the 5,000 things going through my mind of what did I forget? What do I need to do? What's going to, how am I going to do this tomorrow? How am I going to do that? That, my friends, is called being anxious. It's not what God calls us to be. And I'm here to tell you, it's Satan trying to steal your joy away from you. He's trying to steal your thankfulness. When Paul writes that the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Jesus Christ, he's making you a promise. Paul learned through a life of suffering that you learn how to fight suffering and not being thankful to worry by praying with supplication and thanksgiving. I do not believe it's an accident that he added thanksgiving. When your problems arise, you're to pray. You're to, 
go through with supplication, which is a good Old Testament word, which means just petition God. Put those worries in God's hands and say, God, it's yours. It's not my problem anymore. It's your problem. But then he adds another element to it with thanksgiving. When I have troubles, do I take them to God and say, thank you, God, because you're taking care of this? Too often, I can admit, I do not. And I'm here to tell you that when I don't do that, there's a good chance my thankfulness is going to be stolen away. To bring your problems to God and thank Him for resolving them is what faith looks like. We cannot see the outcome. We cannot see the ultimate end and all the troubles that go on. But God can, and he has a plan, and he will take care of us if we but let him. When I take the small picture, and I allow that small picture to overwhelm my faith in God, I realize I am not acting as God requires me to. Now, Paul was no superman, nor was he a super Christian. Too often we look at the Bible people and we go, wow. Those were amazing people, but that's not me. I wish I could be more like Paul, but I can't. And that's basically a cop-out that Satan has sold to you, because I'm here to tell you Paul was just another human being. No better, no worse than you. No more equipped, nor no or less challenged than you. Paul was just a man. And you know what? Paul's faith is as much capable by you as it is by me. But there's a catch. What Paul learned to do and what I need to learn to do is to stop living in the small picture world where I look at the world around me and all my problems and say, oh my, oh my, how terrible, how tough. How can I get through all this ter terrible stuff in my life right now? And instead, look and say, well, God, even in this struggle, are you going to do something wonderful? Paul's entire focus was to focus on Jesus Christ and to serve him in the fullest extent possible. To be honest with you, doing that changes everything. When I face a speed bump as a Christian, I no longer see it as a problem. I see it as an opportunity. Paul started out in Philippians saying, you know what? I'm in prison. And because I'm in prison, there are so many people here that are getting to hear the word of God. What he is saying is, man, it's a great thing to be imprisoned. Now, you and me, we might not be so enthusiastic about it. But what Paul was saying is, man, is God using me here? When you go through struggles in life, Trust me, God has opportunity to use that. I've talked about Johnny Erickson Tata many times, a woman who was paraplegic from age 17 on. She has suffered breast cancer. She has suffered pain throughout her life. This woman has known more suffering than I think any other human being I know alive today. And her attitude is one of thankfulness and praising of God. Why? Because she is seeing a big picture. She is seeing what Jesus Christ can do in her life and through her life. And you know what? She is like Paul in the sense that going, if my life can show a light to someone else, if my life can give focus and give hope to someone else, then all this pain and suffering is worth it. If your focus is on comfort and success in this world, you will never be thankful. You know, the sad truth is, even the most successful people of this world are not satisfied. Howard Hughes, at the time the richest man in the world, was asked by a reporter once, how much more money will it take to make you happy? And Howard Hughes, without batting an eye, said one more dollar. And of course, as soon as he got that one more dollar, one more dollar. Howard Hughes died a broken man in a hotel 
in a very despicable way. He was a broken man when he died. The richest man in the world. He had everything the world could give him. And yet he had nothing. And I see that as a shame because what I see is Christians trying to live in this idea that if I only get success in this world, if I only can get comfort, if I can only have this in my life, then I will be good. And my friends, I'm here to tell you that that's not going to be your life. Your life is to be, as a Christian, a life of reality. You're not going to live above the fray. You're going to live in the fray. You're going to be with all those other folks that are suffering and are dealing with struggle. It is hard for someone who's never suffered depression to counsel someone who's in depression. Because my friends, if you haven't experienced it, it's hard not to know how to say what you need to say. But for a person who has experienced it, they can go, my friend, I've been where you are. And here's what God has done for me. We get to, in our struggles and our pain, we get to chance to show the world what God's love is. Paul saw that and said, hey, if that furthers the gospel, bring on the pain, bring on the suffering. When Paul was finally killed, a very painful death, by the way, he went to Jesus knowing that he was not fearing what eternity brought. When Paul came before Jesus Christ, he came expecting and knowing that he was coming before his Savior. He was going to spend all of eternity with him, that his pain and suffering would be gone. This year, my friends, as we go to Thanksgiving, if you want to be more thankful this year, view life from a big picture. And even then, look at the bad of your life and say, look at what God can do with that. If it brings you closer to God, if it brings someone else closer to God, then brah, let's bring on the trouble. Paul rejoiced in his troubles. He was truly thankful. And I would suggest to you, my friends, you and I have the ability to do just that if we but keep the bigger picture and not the smaller picture of what was going wrong. My friends, this is a Thanksgiving time where we need to find ourselves looking to God and thanking Him, not only for the good times, not only for the blessings, but sometimes for the hard times, sometimes for the trials, sometimes for the difficulties, because He will use those as well for a Christian. So be thankful this year. Our God is truly blessing us, even in our hard times. Thank you.